catch Chris Smith. Yeah, this is exactly what it's about right here. This is, you talk all the time about all these numbers, all these specifics, but what's important to keep in mind is that the leaderboard can change at any any single event. And when we talk about yesterday's top eight, which unfortunately we couldn't stream, it was, it was loaded. It was loaded with leaderboard players, huge shifts, and now we're facing up against the last event as here comes a turn two up the Beanstalk, a great start for Robert Gonzi against Cliff Ware D, who's wearing the chef hat today, needs to cook, needs a good performance, like you mentioned in the pre-show, a lot on the line here as far as leaderboard considerations has chosen azorius control up against enigmatic fires who has had a great start with a follow-up fable the mirror breaker after up the beanstalk has entered play see if cliff has anything to say about that does not and here's the goblin shaman token an awesome start for robert Gonzi. yeah and this is sort of what robert is looking for robert is needing to have these early uh, problematic cards resolve that Cliff's, you know, Supreme Verdict isn't just going to overwhelm, right? A lot of the Azorius control deck strength is the fact that these Wrath effects are so, so powerful in Pioneer. Gaining some counter spells, counter spells, excuse me, from the Discover deck is also a nice change of pace. But yeah, you see Robert here discarding one of his strongest cards in Fires because that's not what the game's about. He just wants raw card quality. Yeah, you want to talk about what's good against control decks. It's very often, right, these cheap cards that Robert Gonzi's actually been able to stick. And, you know, even your 5-plus stuff up the Beanstalk's going to give you a little bit of rebate, even if those get met with counter spells now going forward. Part of why that card is so impactful in this matchup. Fires, on the other hand, pretty easy to just tap out, get tagged, and suddenly, you know, you're kind of behind a little bit. But Fires of Invention is going to resolve for Robert Gonzi, and there is Enigmatic Incarnation. This is all the cards, all the pieces. Cliff Boyer D yet to cast a spell as Enigmatic Incarnation is in. Yeah, I think the chef is just not cooking this game. He's well, giving me a bland you soup. You know, he's got a little <laughs> clam chowder. I needed something spicy, Cliff, if we're going to have this crazy weekend. And this is sort of the problem with the Azorius control decks. You theoretically are doing really well against a lot of the good, strong decks in Pioneer. And Ignamic Fires here, the Yorgon deck from Robert Gonzi, is obviously great. We've seen Derek Davis dominate our events and top eight the Pro Tour this year playing this deck. By no means is it a, a bad deck. But it is one of the more weird off-the-wall decks that this deck sometimes, if you have the right draws, can't line up well against. And this is the problem with playing decks like Azorius Control. Sometimes things just don't line up correctly. Yeah, we're seeing, I mean, like you mentioned, the uh, Enigmatic Incarnation decks called an Enigmatic Fires, named after the two cards that were just played. And you see the Fires of Invention was actually sacrificed to the Enigmatic Incarnations. It means we're looking for a five, which this deck has plenty of options. We've seen Robert Gonzi kind of taking a minute to think over what, you know, what we might want. Ken Rith was pulled to the front initially, and that is ultimately going to be what is selected. Don't draw a card off being stock. Remember, that is only when you cast it. This is not being cast. It's putting directly into play. So Ken Rith is in play. Not going to draw a card from Beans, that's all right, as Memory Deluge, looking for some help. First spell cast by Cliff Boyardee, definitely has a lot of work to do in this board state. Yeah, we're going to need something like a Wrath to clean stuff up, but you kind of want to wait because the Fable's flipping, and but then the Fable gives haste with the Kinrith, so maybe you die. It's a lot of pressure going on here. One thing I do want to highlight real quick is Robert's deck is also a Yorgon deck. I think his Yorgon's a little off screen right now, but I just wanted mm -hmm. to highlight that. So that is something that Robert also has access to of the pick up a Yorgon, do some kind of big flicker plays as well. Yeah, I mean, that's huge here, right? You can get your card back from up the beanstalk. You can flip or the, flicker the up the beanstalk, get another card coming there. I mean, this just the Yorin with beans is already quite mm -hmm. strong. But uh, with no fires in play anymore, the, the buy Yorin play at the same turn does get a little bit harder. But uh, we'll see what this Kinrith can add to the mix as, you know, Robert Gonzi very much just what's what's on the board is what matters for him. Cliff, on the other hand, is searching for answers with a hand full of cards as here is another hollowed fountain. Looks like it's coming in tapped and back over to Gonzi we go. I mean, <laughs> taking a moment reading all the cards. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah Gonzi has the new, the new get lost in hand there, which answers creatures, enchantments, and planeswalkers. That's like all of Cliff's, you know, strong cards here are things like the Wandering Emperor, Leyline Binding, etc. Now, obviously, you know, the Wandering Emperor is going to sell the minus. The Leyline Binding, you know, won't do much here. Just kill the Fort Flickers. But it is, you know, a really powerful catch-all spell and a great addition for this deck. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, great addition, I, I think, to the format in general mm -hmm. you know we're gonna see the copies of those that card in cliff's deck as well you know one of the better removal spells we've seen printed uh was it fateful absence a similar card that has seen mm -hmm. play previously this card you know pretty i'm not gonna say strict upgrade but an upgrade uh i, I nonetheless in this format mm -hmm. unless you're like me you're always flooding just, then it's a draw too 
Sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's just a, my my opponent should not cast it against me. That's what you're learning here. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a bad spot to be. It's your, your Kenrith and the Goblin Shaman going to rumble into the red zone, it looks like. Should be knocking Cliff down quite a bit. Now suddenly facing down Lethal on board with a reflection of Kiki Jiki in play as well. Got to need to find an answer. Now, a card we talked about a little bit before the show, Mason, that uh, would be a big one for Cliff to have here specifically is Farewell. All this work that Gonzi has done, getting ahead on board in, in all kinds of ways. We're talking about enchantments. We're talking about you know just treasures hanging around. Kenrith can do stuff as uh, Robert does actually just go ahead and buy Yori in there. And... Um, it could, yeah, here, let's get this farewell up. This is a card that could actually get Cliff back in this game and actually ahead. You know, he's got a pile of cards in hand, hasn't committed anything to the board, and now suddenly, you know, is something you could have here to get back in the game. But only one copy in the main deck would have had to have been a really good hit off of that memory day in order to have it here. As yeah, the enigmatic you... incarnations going to find a Heliod. Yeah, and this is one of the value plays here. You're seeing, you know, Fable normally <laughs> gets a lot of value from copying stuff here we're turning it into the heliod getting it back into our uh, hand so we can deploy it again and it's actually kind of a nice way to play around something like farewell there we are presenting a strong board presence and that and you're seeing here cliff showing a lot of patience here holding the wandering emperor fell to nine on the attack there but now we're going to be back up to 11 i believe there with the wandering emperor's minus two and cliff boy rd might be able to get out of this if we have a card like farewell this turn because robert did not have a land drop and we might be having a little bit of issues actually deploying everything because those treasures will also go to the farewell yeah that's true it's something i mean even like a supreme verdict here plays because this heliod you know kind of unintuitively does not actually have indestructible unlike you know a lot of the original printings and stuff like that so even just a normal sweeper we're no longer facing leaf on board anymore that was not the case previously this wandering emperor does flip that a little bit uh getting taking care of that kenrith as we're going to go ahead and make a 2-2. Two -two. That'll help check that Goblet Shaman if that's how you want to line things up. But does speak to maybe not having any kind of sweeper that we plan on casting this turn if we're going to go ahead and activate that now. Mm -hmm. There is the Samurai. 2-2 two -two with Vigilance. Damn, the oh, chef does not seem to have his tools in the kitchen there. I was looking for his tokens. I expect better from the boy RDs, but it's a long day, <laughs> Look, you know? When, when you're in the feature match area, the people carry your tools for you. You know, it's like it's like <laughs> surgery where you just ask, you know, I have a scalpel or whatever you need. Samurai, thanks. You can get handed to you. You don't need to know what stuff is. You got it covered. Fair, fair, fair. I'm not yeah, used to that. The fairy, the face of blue white control. That one's going to go immediately after that enigmatic incarnation. No second thought about that one. See ya later. And Gonzi just kind of shrugging. Okay, well, got another one in hand. <laughs> we can see him fanning through a ton of bangers in uh, Gonzi's hand. All spells, not a land in sight. <laughs> so, <laughs> fun. Fun thing here, Drake, we have Omen of the Sea in hand, so we can just scry those other two to the bottom, maybe keep one and draw for our <laughs> turn, and it's just right back in our hand. I'll if take we want. that, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No. Well, we're not about it. We're going to draw, and it looks like another copy of Fable the Mirror Breaker, number three. Not a bad card to be flooded on overall. It is pretty good in this matchup, but this Teferi, as it always does, is threatening to kind of take over this game if Robert does not have a big turn here. Does have a still solid board presence, thanks to Heliod and the Goblin Shaman. On board, looks like we could maybe clean up this Teferi, presuming there's no kind of tricks that Boyer D could have in order to stop that from happening. Yep. A lot of options to consider, no matter how you slice it as far as what you want to do after that, though, is here is Deputy of Detention coming down. I love this. That card is such a liability in this matchup. You know, if now Cliff doesn't have many things, but it's not even like a Yorion, right? Going underneath the Deputy, that's a huge liability. So just trading it now for this Samurai to make it so we cleanly kill the Teferi is a great place to be. Yeah, nothing feels worse, right, than getting Wrath, and then they get you know, the Planeswalker back on the board, so you get to set up the Wrath Planeswalker for them. Not great. A, a solid way to set up Deputy to look like a real piece of cardboard in this matchup, able to take care of a token. Not going to get anything back if a Sweeper does come down. And a bunch of treasures piled up there for Gonzi. Now kind of maybe in double spell tor territory. Chooses not to play anything at all and passes the turn on back to Cliff. A lot of patience here, like you called out. Yeah, I'm really, I like the way Gonzi is approaching this. You know, I think it's very easy to slam something like Fable here. And, you know, I might even like do it without second thought. And I think it might be wrong. Because I think you are in a position where it's just like, hey, it's farewell or bust. You know, like I probably wouldn't use this omen to see to make land drops, nothing else, you know? Yeah, and, and like a sweeper has to happen for this game to continue, right? If you just keep playing Planeswalkers, I imagine that there's going to keep getting cleaned up by this, you know, motley crew of creatures that Robert has assembled in play. So it's like, okay, like you have to take a meaningful game action, especially one that is somewhat sweepers uh, shaped that does answer my board state. And if you don't do that, like we can just keep playing all day. I'll accumulate resources in my hand and eventually just overwhelm you with, with value. 
and that's maybe what's happening here is Teferi does come down up tick. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get that loss. See you later, Teferi, uh, mm -hmm. on instep. Going to take care of that and maybe keep keep beating up face. Still short of lethal right now. But... Yeah, I, even if we transform the healer out, we're not quite there. Yeah, that adds a point. Right, mm -hmm, I believe so. Let me get a get a look here at Heliod the Radiant Dawn, or specifically Heliod the Warp Eclipse. True, I love Phyrexia. <laughs> Do you? Yeah, well, we're not seeing any more of that. So uh, tough. tough ah, come on! Me. What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, quite a lot. I think we. Yeah, we. It is actually uh, a four six. So we don't even get any another point of power on Heliod the Warp. What? Eclipse. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> no upgrades. No upgrades at all. As Robert Gazi's taken another non-land draw step, and you see that Enigmatic Fires flip face up there from the Teferi earlier. We do know about that card, so does Cliff, and it's just hanging out there. Oh, we did, we did draw land. Okay, I see. I see. We drew land. A beautiful deck here, all foils from mm -hmm. Robert, as we uh, smash face. The aggro deck mm -hmm. in this matchup is Enigmatic Fires, and that is five, six, seven damage. Looking to put Cliff down to two. Yeah, I thought Cliff had something like the Wandering Emperor, which is why, you know, we lined up the Teferi uptick. You know, we were trying to get them to go after the Teferi. We Emperor, the Teferi goes to like one. You know, we call it a day. We pull really far ahead. And then Robert, you know, saving that get lost here for the Teferi. And then it might just be Cliff once again showing an amount of extreme amount of patience with this Wandering Emperor as we saw in the earlier turns in the game. Yeah, we, we did see this before, right, where it, it, Cliff just waited till instep, stop any kind of sorcery speed tricks, especially for things like uh, the Enigmatic Incarnation that could potentially find an answer to Wandering Emperor, kind of keeping that from happening and just, like, making sure that you get to untap with your Wandering Emperor could be part of the equation as Yorian is on the stack. Cliff giving that one some thought. Yeah. Doing a little bit of math. Yeah, that, yeah that'll that kill you. That'll kill you, Cliff. And I'm going to go ahead and Field of Ruin targeting. <laughs> Robert says, I don't know, I got all dual lands. Target whatever you want. Yeah. Goes after the breeding pool, it looks like. And this is going to get the Ignamic uh, Incarnation, excuse me, off the top of the deck, which I think is maybe what Cliff is wanting to have happen. Is, you know, he knows he's going to have to get a chain of events to happen to win. That's pretty absurd. You know, that doesn't involve Farewell. If we have Farewell, it's going to be a pretty easy, like, hey, the game's going to keep going. Otherwise, we're going to need to have stuff going. So getting rid of that means, okay, I got to hope we draw some lands from Robert. I need things to go my way. And getting this Jorgon down with the Beanstalk draw trigger on the stack, this can't let them have that. And the Bean is almost assuredly going to get flickered to get even another card. And right. that is why yeah, you know, we get a card already, so you know, from Yori and uh, being cast. And that's where we responded to make sure that that uh, incarnation did not go to hand. So that's, yeah, that Beans trigger was on the stack. Went ahead and did some flickering. Beans, Deputy, <laughs> and Heliod. Oh, value town. Deputy hits the map, gets all the maps, get out of here, get lost, <laughs> boom, boom. Yeah, get lost and then get your maps lost too. Not only are you lost, but your creature's lost, everything's lost. Nobody knows where they are, and I have a pile of creatures threatening to kill you. What do you have? Cliff needs to have it here. Narset, that one can still find Supreme Verdict. Four mana left over. We might just be on Supreme Verdict or bust. Yeah, I think Look Verdict is our cleanest answer. What do we got? And we got game two, Drake. Is nothing. <laughs> Cliff picks it all up. And a dominant game one, I'd say, from Robert Ganzi in the Enigmatic Fires deck. We were talking a little bit before the match how we thought, you know, traditionally there have been a lot of expensive spells within the Enigmatic Fires deck that make it a little bit of a tough, tough sledding against a counterspell filled deck like Control. Not really what we saw play out there at all. Yeah, we kind of had the right mixture, right? Like the bean didn't do a ton, but it did kind of smooth our draw, made it so that the game went longer. We were going to continue to get those resources going. And then Fable of the Mirror Breaker did what Fable does, smoothed our draw, made our everything come together just like the beanstalk. And that was allowing us to kind of have that consistent stream of threats. And Cliff had the classic problem that you and I seem to have about blue-white control, which is you don't really do anything. You know, right. you don't really win the game. You sit there for forever. Theoretically, you're good against some stuff, but even in practice, sometimes you just sit there and they draw out of it. Yeah, and not a deck I've been overly impressed with, but I'll tell you what, a lot of the NRG people here and, and the players playing today, playing for a lot of leaderboard points, seem to love the deck. But I tell you what, let's go see what Cliff has to work with in the sideboard and see what we can maybe uh, shore up a little bit as we move into game number two. Here's Cliff Boyardee's Azorius Control deck. It, it, Cliff's hidden it, you know. Uh, there it is. All right, we're back here. All right, all right. <laughs> I mean, we joked how the deck doesn't do anything. I figured the deck. Yeah. Anyways, 
<laughs> so we got an arc out of a Miria, three Chromo Seed Shark, a Tishana's Tide Binder, new one from Lost Caverns, Ixalan, the Orion, of course, uh, two Aether Gusts, two a Narset Reversal, two Mystical Disputes, a Starnheim Unleashed, a second copy of Farewell, and two Rest in Peace. What do you like here, Mason? I really like the Farewell. We talked about how we only had one of those. We kept one to draw in game one. I want that second one. Gimme, gimme. Aether Gust, very similar. You know, while not a permanent answer to a lot of these problems, just buying yourself a little bit of time. You know, imagine you play your Teferi 5, you tick up, they make their big turn play, you gust it. That buys you a lot of time. Teferi will take over the games in situations like that. Mystical Dispute is something I'm kind of eyeballing as sort of a minor upgrade, right? The Farewell, I'm kind of slamming in my sideboard. That's going in. Right. The Aether Gust, I'm slamming. This, these next cards I'm going to talk about, Mystical Dispute, Chrome Host, Seed Shark. These are ones where, you know, my deck is 80 cards. How do I want to position the game? How do I think my opponent's deck is constructed? That's what really what's going to lead to these decisions here. So personally, I like the idea of having a couple Mystical Dispute, having a couple Chrome Host, Seed Shark. I really want to win the game. And honestly, if I'm Cliff Boyer D, draws are not allowed. Right. I have to top eight this event. I want to go to the Players' Championship. And for me, that's going to put Chrome Host Seed Shark in the main. I'm down a game. We've got to win the game quickly. Yeah, I definitely buy that. And, you know, maybe it can be tough. Like you mentioned, right, finding the right mixture between the sweepers and, like, the threats that get the game done with. Um, you know, I'm sure Cliff's going to be able to figure that out. Has had a lot of success. It, on the Energy Series, uh, let's go ahead and move over to Robert Gonzi and the Enigmatic Fires deck. See what upgrades we can make in that department. I cannot read that first card, so I'm going to read it off of this. We got three copies of Mystical Dispute, three copies of Rending Volley, two Fateful Absence, two Radiant Flames, two Rest in Peace, one Alpine Moon, one Nimble Larcenist, and the, of course the Yorian that likely is going to stay in the sideboard. What kind of upgrades can we make here? Yeah, so we got a lot of pretty interesting stuff going on. So we have the Fateful Absences. So we have those that answer cards like Teferi, like Narset, like the Wandering Emperor. We're going to definitely want those in. We have some kind of medium removal spells in our deck. That's going to be kind of a nice upgrade. The Nimble Obstructionist is just kind of a good sort of, hey, I play this. You know, it messes them up a little bit. Mystical Dispute, by the way, premium. That seems is premium. the one. <laughs> that one seems yeah. really good. We're going to slam that one in our sideboard. Three right. of those. We are going to win some counter wars in the early game. And that, you know, we talked about Robert in game one. This is sort of happening here as our players are finishing up their shuffling right now. We're going to need to stick something early, and Mystical Speed allows us to you know, play a little bit slow in the early turns, and then if uh, Cliff tries to jam something like a Teferi where Narset's going to get punished, and then we can fight a counter war, and for one mana, win the war back. So this is the way Robert's going to have to approach it. And, you know, Cliff, by the way, no stranger to uh, Pioneer. He's gotten most of the, his points this year on the leaderboard playing Pioneer. Now, normally, Boros Convoke, but... Still someone who plays a lot of Pioneer are very ready. And I can tell from Robert and the way that he navigated that game, also someone who plays a lot of Pioneer, the all-foil deck definitely helps with the tails there. But, you know, he's clearly someone who's played this matchup before and did not seem lost or confused and kind of had a game plan the entire way, right? Very quickly discard some right. of our extra fires. Knew I didn't need to worry about that getting countered. I'd rather have another card. I'm going to sack this Fable of the Mirror Breaker. I'm going to get Heliod. That's the kind of play where if you haven't played this deck a lot, you might be scared to sacrifice Fable the Mirror Breaker on camera because Switch Chat's going to go, Sacrificing Fable? Fable? Have you Is read that the card? Is <laughs> Fable! Wizards! Save oh me from this Miss Ginger! You know, and so <laughs> and we're out here crying, and, you know, Robert's just like, Giga Chad, yeah, Heliod, get card back, do again. And he didn't play do it. again. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure he said exactly that. I mean, I, you know, yeah. we have some volume from the uh, from the table i'm sure you know twitch i can confirm or deny but uh, turn one tap town found for cliff gonna be met with looks like spars headquarters as we go ahead and haul the storm giants no play for cliff happy to hold up counter magic or whatever else we could have access to as we go back to robert gonzi thinking about what land to play gonna be stomping ground that one's coming in untapped two points of damage there's another copy of beans the beans oh destiny spinner that one seems pretty good here yeah pull it up yeah i've not seen this one in many moons i believe it's enchantments can't be countered enchantments can't be countered we have a lot of enchantment creatures drake that's the joke oh it's creature and enchantment spells wow you get both no. can't be countered nice little two three there uh gonna function as kind of your own cavern of souls as long as it stays in play as an untapped hollow fountain for cliff Back over to Robert we go. Gotta feel pretty safe. I mean, you need a removal spell for a Destiny Spinner and a counter spell in order to actually be able to counter any kind of creatures or enchantments, which includes Fable the Mirror Breaker, which is being cast right now. <laughs> Cliff just kind of laughing, smiling. Yeah, can't counter that one. Here comes the Goblin Shaman, and here comes two points of beatdowns. March of Otherworldly Light, gonna take that one. Get it out of here. Yeah. Styled. Over to Cliff we go. 
quick draw step there. The Fable was able to to, uh, to resolve, though, and that could be an important piece. You know, like having that turn off to kind of stumble Cliff, make sure that the first thing that Cliff does is answer Destiny Spinner. Is this Fable payoff going to be enough to really capitalize on that? It's irrigated farmland for Cliff. Second chapter of Fable. See if we want to do any discarding. Taking a look here. Yeah, two cards going to hit the bin. Volcanic Spite in the land. Coma among the cards drawn. A little far away from that one right now, but another has those magic words. Uncounterable. Yeah, then has the word almost unkillable. <laughs> Gain yeah, indestructible well. pretty easily. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one becomes really, really hard to kill. Not a lot of exile effects in Cliff's deck, but, you know, you got to have them immediately, or the, uh, the snakes can immediately get out of hand. Two more beats, some Goblin Shaman, a treasure, a mana confluence added, three mana. Here's Fable number two. Nice card to have in multiples. Gonna get Dovin's vetoed pretty quickly from Cliff, and back to Cliff we go. Yeah, and Dassin and Cliff need it. We need to kind of get, oh no. Let's say we need to get something like a Teferi going. No, how about know, Tackland? Gonna... Restless Anchorage. I'm, I'm having Celestial Colonnade flashbacks. <laughs> As we flip Fable the Mirror Breaker into Reflection of Kiki Jiki. Looks like a Traxa among the mix. A lot of very expensive to cast cards in Robert Gonzi's hand. Yeah, we're kind of flooding out a little bit, but because of this Fable the Mirror Breaker token, we might be able to actually go the distance now. Yeah, even if we have something like the Water Emperor, we have seven mana now, so we get to start slamming. Yeah, we yeah. If, if there's any movement before instep, like we've seen Cliff kind of do previously, there's Atraxa and Coma and even an Enigmatic Incarnation among the mix in order to really you know make this game very difficult. As Coma just gonna be cast right away, no movement from Cliff. This card can't be countered. Gonna demand an answer really quick, or like you said, yeah, okay, we're gonna get a read on this one. Maybe we can get chat to read this one too. The question is, what doesn't it do? Yeah, here we go. Look at this. Seven mana, three GG, you, you. This spell can't be countered. You're gonna have each upkeep, that's both players. Create a three, three blue serpent that you can sacrifice to tap a permanent, shut it down, or give coma indestructible. Yeah, the uh, the uh, <laughs> serpent line, very funny. Yorion, I believe, also a serpent. Oh, uh, yeah, so serpent, you... <laughs> serpent kindred over here. We're doing it. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're, you know, our Yorion's provides even more value these days. Sure, that's what the card needed to do. It wasn't valuable enough. You know, we needed yep. more angles. As Memory Deluge on Instep, gonna gonna hopefully find some answers. Yeah, yeah, hold on, hold on there, Robert. Before that serpent comes down, we may have some effects with the trigger on the stack. Cliff, moving some mana around. And it's going to... Deshauna's Tidebinder! Tide Tidebinder on the trigger? Whoa! All right, a card that we called out in the cyber. Lost Caverns of Ixalan card. Gonna shut down the uh, the triggered ability, and now that one's not gonna happen anymore. Gonna get a look at that one. Flash 3-2. Stops activated or triggered abilities. If it's an artifact creature or planeswalker that is countered, that uh, permanent loses all abilities for as long as it remains on the battlefield. A vanilla 6-6 six -six is Coma. Cosmos Serpent. Not bad, but not what you're wanting in Coma in this matchup. And then Cliff also resolved the Crumb Host Sea Shark this turn. So Cliff kind of taking a turn like, hey, do your worst. It can't be worse than Coma, right? I'm going to deploy these things and try and play my long grindy plan from here. Right. And, and, and you're right. I mean, it couldn't really be that much worse than Coma because we just used a bunch of mana. We used a bunch of the treasure mana that we've been building up from the Goblin Shaman. Like, of course, Robert does actually have some punishing cards in hand. We're looking at, you know, an attraction that backs up by Mystical Speed. We have things to do, but we can't do them until you know we get more mana which now with all these creatures in play this goblin shaman can't really go to work anymore as a copy of the goblin shaman is made by reflection of kiki cheeky now you can just run those you know into the red zone yeah get coma and try to turn it to abyss eventually i mean the card's still a six six and this may not be limited but a six six will still get the job done in some spots as we see cliff of course going to line up a block on the reflection copy that one's pretty free don't think we're interested in blocking the coma quite yet don't have to have some life to play with I like that Cliff took a second to double check. Is there anything I should be worried about from Robert? Like, does Robert have his own ganja? Would he even do it here? You know, I think that was a nice moment there. It's been like, yeah, this is free, right? Double check. Okay, we're good. Even though we're Zorus, we're trying to play quickly. It does, you know, it's important we have these sort of cards that will end the game quickly to make sure we're not skewing them. Right, yeah, yeah. Well, anytime you make any kind of attacks that could be deemed even a little bit suspicious, you have to kind of think about it. And the reflection going away in a turn kind of masks any kind of that Iganjo tricks that you were talking about. Is Enigmatic Incarnation going to be cast? Not a lot of enchantments to work with. Yeah, just the reflection of Kikijiki, which has some value, but we're going to go ahead and get rid of that. Go searching for a four. And last time we did see Robert pretty quickly go find a Heliod. 
adds to the, the power and toughness in the board, gets you a little bit of value for your trouble, and that is what we're going to reach for again. Do again. You got your <laughs> So nice we did it twice. <laughs> yeah. That one. Got to return a fable. Over to Cliff we go. Now, Cliff in a pretty good spot. Anytime you're talking about untapping with Chrome Host Seed Shark, you're not facing down, like, lethal on board. I mean, yet. Obviously, you know, we cleared everything. You would take lethal. But you have plenty of blockers thanks to the Seed Shark, Tide Tidebinder, all these kinds of things. But you're, not, you're not out of the woods, though. Like, mm -hmm. if this Tide Tidebinder goes away, suddenly Coma starts to look, you know, scary again. We have Chrome Host. It does take a little bit of mana to really continue to get the value going on it. So Cliff does still need a pretty impressive turn, but has to feel pretty good about his position right now. Yeah, this is the spot where Cliff's starting to get things not stable. Well, sorry, this isn't the spot where we have to start stabilizing, excuse me, but we're getting very close to it. We kind of have like another turn or so before Cliff really needs to be like, okay, I've got something going on. You know, maybe I wandering Emperor the Chroma, the Coma, excuse me. I got a fairy I protected. Something like that needs to be happening in the relatively near future. And it might be a situation where Cliff's going to take the time to flash back Memory Deluge and try and get a big Incubate token. Mm, Cliff's keeping yeah. the cards close to the chest, so I can't quite see what they are. But that might be what we're sizing up here is take a turn where things get a little bad and then sort of pull ahead. I'm not even sure if that's the right play. We also have this Hall of the Storm Giants that is a 7-7. Seven, seven. So there's a lot of different things going on in the battlefield here. And Robert has to be careful when playing this turn out. Yeah, a lot of ways for Cliff to spend mana as here comes an Alpha Strike. All creatures coming across the red zone. Now uh, the ball's in Cliff's court. So Robert says, all right, I'm not casting anything for combat. Let's just see how this goes. Here's all the creatures. Got to do some blocking. This is a lethal if it can't take the whole thing on the nose. Cliff just content to play land go has to have something to work with the, the very floor like you mentioned could just be how the storm giants fire it up blocks do some blocking and but then you know robert of course we saw drew fires and mentioned poise eventually do some some pretty punishing stuff if cliff does actually tap out here yeah my gut is just a call with the hall but it looks like cliff has something ah memory deluge memory okay Deluge is a good one to have here that one's gonna go ahead and make an incubation token now we see we see Gonzi actually kind of giving it a little bit get a little bit of a read. We have access to a mystical dispute, seeing if you know does this you know making him pay three more mana is that something that matters? Answer, of course, probably not at the moment. Can always cast it on whatever Cliff finds, provided it's not uncounterable. I I wonder if we're supposed to do a trick so we can't transform the incubate token to block. Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe we just let it go and the, the Deluge doesn't matter that much. Or or Gonzi's just, you know, content to keep it for whatever the next play is. I, I, I don't know. I'm sure yeah, I, I, I don't know either. Yeah. Premium in the matchup. Whatever yeah. it hits is going to be good. So, uh, you know, this it's, it's a good spot. Everything's still kind of coming up Gonzi despite, you know, maybe Cliff having some tricks up his sleeve as he looks kind of unsure about what to do with this incubation. Going to go ahead and flip that now. Gonzi says, yeah, go ahead. And doing some blocking on the Heliot. Heliot's a 4 force, so that'll trade. Set to eat the Goblin Shaman. It's uh, So I think Cliff's sizing up, can I play around a card like Get Lost? What am I supposed to do? Because Cliff could put the Tashana and the 4-4 in front of Coma. It's going to lose both of them, but would answer the Coma long term, you know, which is something that the Coma, you know, with the Tashani in play is a little awkward anyways. And that could be a way to sort of really minimize the battlefield. It looks like we're just going to take the two for two, leave our crumb host seed shark, and try and battle through the coma the old-fashioned way, which might be a sign that a card like Farewell was picked up from Cliff. Yeah, at least, yeah, some kind of wrath effect for sure. Here's Fable the Mirror Breaker going to be added to the mix as well. Uh, you know, like you mentioned, Chrome Host Seed Shark can do a lot of the chump blocking, provided Coma stayed just a, you know, 6-6 six, six with no abilities. But with the tie Bender going away, that is not the case. It's here on Upkeep. A Serpent is going to be made. Going to need a huge turn from Cliff here in order to really get out from under this Coma. Yeah, this, this is going to be the pivotal moment. You know, if Cliff has the Farewell lined up, Robert tapping out here, you know, is going to maybe get them now cliff doesn't have enough man to pay for the mystical dispute so robert's you know patience there might pay off in spades but let's see what happens here. cliff does have some big it spell is and, and then oh, three mana very quickly tap robert says no thank you on that one but of course cliff could have disputes of his own and or even Dovin's veto anything like that we got a chromo scene shark of course gonna make a six six and cliff doesn't have an answer oh yeah. no it looks like Cliff was just jamming, and this felt like that had to be the way to get out of it. And now, 
unfortunately, things are so rough here for Cliff Boy RD as Robert is going to have this constant stream of serpents coming in. We can even do stuff like tap the sack the serpent, excuse me, to tap on these creatures. We're going to be able to push so much damage, and Cliff Boy RD is only at eight life. Yeah, you can tap permanence, so you can get the incubation token ahead of it being transformed. There, there's a mm -hmm. lot of there's a lot of problems here for Cliff, and I mean, obviously, he was making on the farewell. We talked a lot over the course of this match about how impactful that card could be. It was set to be extremely impactful here, but Robert, very patient with the mystical speed, was able to line that up perfectly, and now in a commanding position to end this game. We'll see Robert doing a little bit of thinking, trying to figure exactly how to end the game right now. Or if we if we even can, but I mean, whatever our turn looks like, I think is gonna look good. There's a Traxa among the mix, some more mana potentially coming with the Goblin Shaman that I'm not even sure you can block anymore and still survive. <laughs> yeah, it looks like we're gonna discard this Fires to the Chapter Two. That's kind of what Robert's thinking. I also love this, by the way. I can tell Robert's thinking about like, okay, if I just draw a land, what am I gonna do for the turn? You know, let me plan out my whole turn so I can just execute. Now we drew another spell. And that's gonna change up a little bit of what we're thinking about. But I really love the commitment to like, okay, what do I have? What is lethal? What happens here? As we are going to see an attack with all the creatures that can attack. You know, all creatures that are legal attackers going to do so. Going to sack the summoning six serpent, tack down the seed sharp, that seed shark. That one is not going to be doing any blocking. Here comes that uh, transform, which we're going to go ahead and stop. And that it means it is going to be lethal. Some uh, counter magic in hand that did not work yet. Changed the equation. Does not work against Mystic Must Be very well. And, uh, yeah, we're going to move along with things. Robert Gonzi, 2-0 over Cliff RD, which what was a convincing performance. Yeah, that was incredible there for Robert. Played really, really well. I think, you know, Cliff also played well, but had a couple decision points where they were really pivotal, and we just kind of, you know, maybe didn't respect the mystical dispute type payoff that the opponent could be having. I think we thought our opponent had a bunch of big drops in hands. They didn't have lands, which is a reasonable place to be. And we sort of kind of shoved on, like, hey, I need to win quickly. Let's shove here and hope it's good enough didn't pay off Cliff Boy RD, it's an eight round event by no means is dead but it's gonna need to rally hard we're gonna go live into game three of match speed because we have ryan hayes our other outside looking in competitor playing in this feature match area versus i believe kyle let's see who it is there so we're gonna hop right into that match here but yeah a great round there for sure yeah awesome stuff here we are i believe we're coming here live in game three so this is uh this is for the match so whoever wins this one is going to win the match it looks like we got a Lotus Field in play for Kyle Gonzalez, some other mana, a bunch of a uh, bunch of lands for Ryan, a lot of dust settled. I see some vetoes moved, some uh, uh, memory deluge in the yard for Ryan. That card's still in play. One in for Kyle as well. A little bit of memory deluge, but overall, not a lot of, um, I guess, dominance in this game from either player yet. Still a lot of positioning. As here comes a 2 2 shark token, it seems. That one's going to crunch over. Kyle's life total down to 10. Little bit of pressure, but not enough to warrant any kind of panicking yet. Kyle Gonzalez looks to be on the strict proctor kind of build, given the Lotus Field, the strict proctor in the graveyard. As here comes another memory deluge for Ryan Hayes. Gonna go ahead and be cast in probably what is the end step of Kyle Gonzalez's turn. That's gonna get met with a wandering emperor. I love this play from Kyle here. He's like, hey, look, I want to kill this shark. I want to be the one that you need to be having uh, their questions answered. You're going to have to do stuff before you find it here. And yeah, that's going to Oh, Narset's oh. reversal on Jovin's veto? This is a disaster. Yeah. That's going to counter the memory deluge. It's going to make sure that Water Emperor resolves. That's going to take care of the sea shark. That was masterfully set up by Kyle Gonzalez. Yeah, and that is the sort of spot where Narset Reversal is such a backbreaking card in some of these matchups. Very rarely is it the counter spell, but often the counter counter spell, the thing that wins the war. And we're going to see it here. Yeah, Ryan Hayes just has to slam this to Fairy. The coast is clear, but he needs to find something to take over this game because Kyle does have the mana advantage with Lotus Field. It has cards like Discontinuity that can end the game out of nowhere and take multiple turns in a row. Right, absolutely. You know, Ryan, not you know, not in a super bad position, does still have access to the Dovin's veto after the narcissist reversal does return it to hand. Kyle does know about that as well. So a little bit of duel of planeswalkers going on, which Tavari has been known to win in the past, but that was a powerful exchange from Kyle. Gonna go ahead and make a two-two that can start to pressure Tavari. And uh, we'll see if there's any other follow-up. Hard to work around Dovin's veto. That one being uncounterable does mean that you, you kind of have to just jam something into it. But a lot of resources for Kyle to work with, uh, both the memory deluge, which you see pulled to the floor in the graveyard, as well as, like you mentioned, a lot more mana than it seems, thanks to Lotus Field producing quite a bit of mana for one land. And 
little bit of thinking as we pass on back to Ryan. No main face play. And we, oh, we mm. see oh, an set reversal of Ryan's own in hand as well. Picked up what I, I think it's the Doe and Speedo. Yeah, I think we're at double veto Narset's reversal territory. That's a, that's a pretty pretty good place to be in a control mirror, let me tell you. Yeah. I want to give a shout out to you, by the way, for Ryan. We saw the last turn. Obviously, we haven't seen the whole game. Ryan thought a lot about on the turn we came in just slamming the Teferi, right? We saw him kind of flicking in his hand. He waited. While Kyle saw that perfect Narset reversal, Ryan had the punch with Teferi. And now, you know, with this Castle Arden Veil, we're not going to be able to kill the Samurai anytime soon, but we don't need to. We just need to ult this Teferi, and we can start going after Kyle's lands, and it's over. You know, I have never seen a Teferi Ultimate lose without lethal on board already, especially not in any sort of control matchup. We're going to see how it goes here as Ryan does have stuff. Now, Narset's Reversal, I think, doesn't work very well with Embry Deluge because you spend zero mana, but Doan's Veto right. does do a good job of countering it. Yeah, Doan's Veto is going to go ahead and take care of that memory dealer. It's going to have to be part of the piece of the puzzle. Kyle might think he's a little bit in the clear, but we know that Ryan has a lot more tools to work with. And that's kind of, I mean, that's always how, that's the story of Teferi, right? Mm -hmm. You mentioned even like building up to the ultimate. I mean, even just drawing a card every turn, this pressure isn't enough to actually take care of the Teferi before you're going to be drowned in value. Kyle, realizing this, commits his own Teferi to the board, which gets answered by another Dovin's Veto. And uh, Ryan's Teferi going to get attacked by the Samurai, but still with a ton of loyalty to work with. And cards coming every single turn. A little bit of mana rebate. This game is starting to slip away for Kyle as another card comes on the Teferi uptick for Ryan. I think this is just on a Tide Binder in Ryan Hayes' hand. I mean, maybe oh. one of them is, I think there are, there's a mixture of the Narset reversals and the other. And that is actually like having a body matters so, so much here. You can get hit here and just slowly work towards it. Take a look here. Maybe maybe I missed all the card. I know some players are really like Deshaunee Tidebinder because of how versatile it is. And the Discover Combo deck has come out of nowhere. And this is a card that does a lot of good work against it. I do see Ryan Hayes has two of it and two Narset Reversal in hand. So who knows what's actually in hand? <laughs> Yeah, it looks like we're we're at activate Castle Ardenvale to start defending the Teferi. And that I mean that's actually huge. Being able to, to even just chump block or make another one here. Like we made this one on Incept, didn't chump block this turn, and we can um untap it with Teferi. We can make multiple and start doing some double blocking, especially as the hall was added for Kyle. This Teferi is looking to be pretty safe thanks to the stream of tokens that can come from this castle Ardenvale. Is Chrome Host Seed Shark gonna be the play for Ryan Hayes? Another way to start defending this Teferi and nearly free thanks to the Teferi uptick. Kyle needs an incredible turn or this Teferi and Chrome Horse Seed Shark are really going to start to run away with this game. Here's another Teferi for Kyle. Does Teferi put a thing that Tishani can counter? How does the Planeswalker uptick actually work? Uh, I've never had this question before in my life. Yes, okay. it yeah. does. Yes. Ryan yes. seems it, to it, think so. <laughs> it definitely does. I'm sure I have faith in Ryan to read the cards. And uh, we're going to go ahead and cast that on the Teferi uptick. Nice Teferi. That was going to get shut down. Kyle says, yeah, that happens. Trigger is going to happen. Teferi's uptick going to be countered. And that means no land untap. And that's really a huge nerf for this Lotus Field, Hall of the Storm Giant untap that you uh, would be interested in in Kyle's seat. As we go back to Ryan, all things seem to be coming up. Ryan Hayes, and that's exactly what he we needs if he wants Odawara. to uh, stay in the lead with this leaderboard considerations. Odawara, the pickup. Yeah, Kyle is our number one person. Kyle has top eight at every event where our coverage has died. Has also been great throughout the year normally, don't get me wrong. But every time coverage dies, Kyle is in the top eight. So you haven't got to see yeah. as much as him on the leaderboard as we normally want to. And yeah, we see we're an aggressive minusing of the Teferi, and we're attacking Kyle because that Teferi is turned off as long as Shoshana is in play. And, you know, Drake, you know, I'm going to go on a limb here. I'm going to ask Kyle again. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle's seen control. enough. Kyle's seen enough. I don't blame them one bit. Know when you're dead. Don't waste mm -hmm. mental energy on games that have slipped away. And I think uh, Kyle made the correct assessment. Of that. I don't know what the odds are winning that game. Mm -hmm. I can tell you they're not high. And Ryan mm -hmm. will win this match two games to one in uh, what was a – I'm not going to say dominant, but an impressive performance. I think, like you mentioned, when you're talking about the control mirror, there could be a lot of play to it, especially when you're talking about the vetoes, Narset's reversal stuff. There's some really punishing setups. It looks like Kyle had um, you know, really kind of stolen the lead a little bit with that Narset's reversal, but the follow-up to Ferry uh, for Ryan really, I mean, went on to seal that game. It just upticked, 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 and was able to run away with the game like we've seen Teferi do before. 
Yeah, and this is kind of the classic play pattern if you play control decks and you're maybe struggling the mirrors. Someone does something and then you need to have the strong follow-up, right? You kind of want to be the one going second. And what kind of was masterful about Ryan's play there is he set up a thing with the memory deluge to think you have to fight over if you're Kyle. You cannot let Ryan be pulling ahead with a hand like, like Kyle had there. But it ended up setting us up perfectly for the Teferi Time Rival. Now, we're going to interview Ryan Hayes and talk to him about his leaderboard race and everything here in just one second. I'm pulling it up. But yeah, incredibly well played by both those players. Kyle, by the way, is locked for our end-of-the-year championship. They have won an event, so they're already locked in. But Kyle is battling for our player of the year, so I'm sure we're going to see more Kyle as Kyle and Dykeman, two members of Swish Gaming, are battling it out this weekend. We also have plenty of other people, by the way. You know, we talked a little bit about it. Chris Smith, we're going to get a checkup with him in a second, also a member of Swish Gaming. I was talking to them at a recent uh, other tournament series going on, and the Swish Gaming guys are like, yeah, we're wanting to get, like, all of us in so we can test together and just go to this <laughs> event and crush and, you know, they're in a really good position. to. They have two locked, but can they get the third? That's kind of where we're at here. And Ryan Hayes is doing his best to be like, no, 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 no. I am the last one in. It's gonna be okay. I, I want to get in. I mean, yeah. yeah, that's that's the story of these. I mean, the way the leaderboards, these these structures work, these invite-only events, it, it always comes down to the wire. I have very rarely seen it to where the last event isn't critical for numerous players looking mm -hmm. to uh, punch their ticket to the end of the year championship. And it looks really like quickly, we have Ryan Hayes. In the before we jump in, A. Adams and Chris Smith, two people at large, battled each other. Chris Smith came out on top. So it is a, a wild weekend. Yes. Yeah. Ryan, how you doing, buddy? You're, you're so humble all the time. You're doing good. I just came on camera. I kind of got him, showed him how it's done, sucked my Teferi. And that seemed like a really, you know, interesting game. How did that one sort of play out? We came in right when the Narset reversal member day loose turn happened. Yeah, and that's a big part of something I want to highlight for the control, the these control mirrors. Like, obviously, you looked very comfortable with it. I don't know how much you know you would play with the the Lotus Field specific version, but you looked very comfortable in the the control mirror style setup. Um, and I was I wanted to highlight. You know, you got the memory dealers countered. That Narcissus reversal turn happened, but you were able to untap, slam to fairy, and just run away with the game from there. How important is it? Just making sure that no matter what happens, to fairy is the thing that resolves at the end of the day. Okay. Mm. Biggest point. Speaking of a hero and some beatdowns, I want to talk about Tishani Tidebinder because that card seems very impressive. And I'm seeing you're rocking two of them. What are your thoughts on that card? Because what seems to be the story of LCI is this card is coming out of nowhere, you know, seemingly and just going into every format. The random, the new random combo decks and stuff. I'm very, very excited to play with that card. First time playing with that card today. Nice. Well, Ryan, I, we got to do a little check-in. So yesterday, I don't know if you knew, our coverage died. So we didn't get to actually watch the feature matches. We're going to have them up on YouTube later. But I want to talk about your day because you had a crazy day. You ended up accidentally maybe, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but you ended up in ninth with the handshake. Was that just a point of like, hey, I want to lock up points and make the player championship? And the kind of follow-up to this is, how are you feeling about the race? Because you're in fifth place right now. I don't know if you knew that on the leaderboard points. We have the updated board. You're in fifth with Cliff Boy RD being the person on the outside looking in currently. Uh, yeah, I thought I was drawing in the top eight yesterday, and then the table below us also took a draw and ended up jumping me on breakers, which was awkward. I uh, was pretty mm -hmm. disappointed with that. Uh, woke up this morning to Fletcher having won the event yesterday, which took me from, <laughs> from first man out to first man in, and so mm -hmm. was pretty excited about that this morning, and now we're just, just playing games. Heck yeah. All right, I like it. Good to have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Ryan, we're probably be hopefully seeing more of you this weekend. Go take some time to relax. You played Teferi, which we're a little disappointed in, but you need your, <laughs> your time. We're going to come back to the booth and wrap things up for this round. We'll see you later. Good luck, Ryan. Awesome. Thank you, guys. You know, 
the kids, they don't, they haven't learned yet that you can't trust a favorite consistently, but that's okay. You know, it's the new generation. <laughs> we we learned who well, among us in a place less for them. Yeah. <laughs> but no, jokes aside, it was great to talk to Ryan there. And we're going to go on a quick break. We're going to be back in just two minutes with some more Magic Gathering. So take a second, get some water, and sit down for an exciting day of Magic Gathering. 